Our next speaker, David Rich, has come up from Interactive Supercomputing. Hands, show of hands, please. How many of you use MATLAB, R, numerical Python? One hand, two hands. Okay. So what he can do for you is make it run really fast on large clusters. If that doesn't grab your interest, I don't know what will. So with no further ado, David, please. Now, I, I am quite conscious of the fact that um, I am the only vendor doing a talk. And I, I noticed that in the list of speakers. So I, I have thrown out, I mean, there, there might be a vendor or two slide in here, and I apologize for that. But I'm, I'm going to attempt to do a presentation as if I got a PhD in something, which I did not, um, and have been doing research on it, which I obviously haven't. Um, so I'm going to try to do more slides faster. I'm going to uh, torture an analogy for you. Um, we ha I have some easy slides about what we're about. And um, I guess if I can uh, put something across in this talk, it's not about our particular product, but about the category of product that we are in. Because there are, there are multiple of them, and I think they're all worth paying some attention to. Um, we've done some surveys recently, and I think some of the results are interesting. So we can talk about that. A little bit about the product and a little bit about some of the benchmarks. Let me jump into it. So here I'm going to torture an analogy. So here is a very simple hand drill. This is software carpentry. This is a tool. Um, I'm uh, from, uh, well, my grandfather was in the tools business. So this is a, a simple hand drill. It's easy to use. It's very portable. You can pick it up quickly, and it's hard to hurt yourself. Uh, it's not very fast. Um, uh, this is a drill. Uh, this one is actually from my grandfather's hardware store. I still use it. Um, it's, it's faster, obviously. It's also not hard to lear learn. You, you, you can hurt yourself. It, it does have a power cord, though somebody, I think it must have been my dad, ripped off the ground pin, so it's, it's a little bit dangerous. It is metal. You can get a shock when you pick it up. Um, but, it, but it could be right. Um, here's another drill, which I, I, I took a look at just uh, through Google surfing. This evidently is a drill. Um, and these are some of its specifications for how it drills. Um, I, don't, I don't even really profess to know what a uh, spindle travel of 10 inch will, will do for you. Um, it's obviously uh, requires a lot of training. I presume that before you would drill anything, it might take you quite a while to, uh, to figure out how to set it up. So, so let's relate this to software carpentry. I think this is roughly Excel, Basic, MATLAB, uh, Python, R, Ruby. There's probably a you know, a whole list of things that are quite easy to pick up, but quite limited. Um, Fortran, C++, uh, with some libraries are probably a fast thing you can do on, on, your, on your workstation with a little bit more effort. Uh, if you're going to get into this, you're going to teach yourself MPI. You're going to know what OpenMP is. You're going to play with thread building blocks, perhaps. Maybe you're going to play with CUDA. You are, you are already in, the, in the, the realm here of having gotten trained on the specific, uh, specificity of the tool. Uh, there's also another drill. This is where we're torturing the analogy. Um, here's a drill that's, that's kind of a, a combination of some of the, some of the other things. It's, it's portable. Um, it's pretty easy to use. It's, it costs a little more than a, a simple hand or electric drill. You do have to make sure that there's charge in it. Um, it, it it's a compromise of some form. You're not getting the, the, the most power that you would get out of, out of another tool. And I, I think this drill is very similar, at least in a tortured analogy, to the um, class of products that, that, that we are in. Our product is Star P. Uh, MATLAB has PCT and DCS. There's a, a product called Revolution R, which is like a parallel R. Um, there are parallel Python efforts. The, the, goal, the goal of this class of tools is to, to try to retain as much as possible of the ease of use of the desktop tools, um, but deliver some performance that approaches, at least in some reasonable sense, um, what you might get if you actually went ahead and learned MP, MPI or played with CUDA or did something like that. So that's, that's the goal of what these tools are about. Here's some uh, easy slides. This is, so this is, what, this is what we do. This is what we're about, and I think it's what the other tools are about. We, we are focused on people we call domain experts, um, and we want them to solve problems faster. Um, I use this slide at a non-technical meeting. What we, what we mean about a domain expert is somebody who is not specifically a computer scientist. They are very much about solving some other problem. 
I, I, I always have mixed feelings when I meet somebody who's, who's in one of these domains and they start talking to me about how many petabytes the thing was and what the file system they're using and how they program the such and such. Because it, it, it's, it's, it's very nice from one perspective, but from another perspective, it feels like, oh my God, here's a guy that could cure such and such disease or solve such and such problem, and he's messing with you know, MPI setup files and this kind of thing. It doesn't, it doesn't really feel right. So anyway, that's what we mean by domain experts. And the, the, the insight that started our product and um, I think some of the others is that depending on whose numbers you, you pay attention to, there might be about four million domain experts that are stuck in the, in the box, which is a, a desktop PC or laptop or, or single system. Um, and, and I think this crowd knows that there's more data available now. There's more advanced analysis available now. There's, there's multiple domains that can be brought to bear. A couple of speakers talked about how you have multiple kinds of experts involved in solving one problem. So, so this is not that big a box for that kind of analysis. And, and some of these other platforms really, in the, in the scheme of uh, laboratory expenses or, or, or people expenses, these are not that expensive. Obviously, if you bought this, if you bought the whole thing, it would be very expensive. But um, you know, people can get time on these machines, portions of these machines, relatively easily. And certainly, some uh, form of small server cluster is not uh, an expensive equipment if, if people knew how to use it. There was a, it, it, a, lo a long time ago, there were workstation vendors, and, and, and uh, uh, workstations cost you know five to ten times as much as a um, as a, as a desktop machine, and some, for some kinds of workers, it was worth it to spend fifty to hundred thousand dollars on their piece of hardware so they could do their work. That was that was kind of a normal thing. We've we've drifted away from that. Now everybody gets this, but people still could economically justify something like that if they could figure out how to use it. So what we do is, uh, and what a lot of the other products do, is we we let people st sit in this environment. And we then let them export the work off into uh, some, some other resource of, of, uh, of computing, whether that's a corporate resource or a department. Um, gr lately, uh, lately, there's been a lot of hype, certainly, and gradually more reality around actually um, sending your, your work uh, off-site into some you know, Amazon-style or other cloud computing-style uh, resource, and, and certainly that to us, we didn't, I mean, in all candidness, the product was not designed with that in mind, but once you, once you split the, the, the user interface from the compute resource, it's, it's not that much harder to send it a little bit further away. Um, one of the things that is often the case is that the thing that becomes the bottleneck on, on the desktop side is not the number of CPUs you can apply, but it's the amount of memory or how fast your I.O. structures work or this kind of thing. And, um, that becomes a, a key a key factor in moving to a multi multiple system scenario. One of the, the other things that we we think though um, our customers are not necessarily hitting, hitting us over the head with this yet is that the data sets themselves are are large, and when you start to get into collaborations, you know there's a question of where does the data reside, and it's hard to make the re data reside in multiple places. So you want to bring the, the compute to the data, and yet again, you want to do that in a way that somebody doesn't have to learn uh, all kinds of complicated protocols or staging or scheduling, or how does their workload manager work as opposed to our work scheduler. Um, and so again, products like this try try to hide that. We do we do survey, um, you know, you uh, just the same way as in science and modern day marketing. All we do is. Um, is gather links and send out things and catch email addresses and eventually you use those things for, for surveys. So here's a survey we did recently. Um, would you like to use lower level um, uh, source libraries with a higher level language? So one of the re reasons why these, these higher level tools are easy to use is because there is an awful lot of pre-existing functionality available that you can just adopt. And so overwhelmingly, people want, want to do that. Um, 
the only reason I included this one is I think this is evidence that the, the desktop users want to stay desktop users. They don't want to go program some statistics function. They just want to use a statistics function. Uh, what is the primary factor you have for, for why do you need parallelism? 56% um, runtimes are taking way too long, another 18% growing data sizes exceed current systems available. I, I happen to know that um, some percentage of this 56% who say it's taking too long don't realize that it's taking too long because they don't fit in memory. So, but in any case, 75% uh, of the people um, are, are worried with compute time. Now, that's, that's, different, that's different than um, uh, this one, 15% trying to leverage multi-core systems. I don't know how many of you have had a user or are a user who's realized that a code that you've been happily using has just gotten slower when you got your new computer. Um, there are people, there are people hitting on that, but this is not, um, this was not the motivation for these people. These people actually want to run things faster, which, which I find interesting. Um, here's one, um, cloud computing. It's, in the vendor community, maybe in the academic community, it's a continuous debate how much of this cloud thing is hype and how many people actually are interested in using it. 41% um, um, said yes, they, they, they would like to do that. We have, we have customers um, using our on-demand service and usually, at least for now, it's been an, an experimental basis. By an experiment, I mean they have some analysis they want to do and they want to prove whether or not this analysis can produce any useful results. And then if it does produce resu useful results, they might go out and buy hardware to run it. Uh, they might say, um, you know, I have a cluster this size, I want to see if it actually scale to this size before I buy a bigger cluster. And they'll go out and run it on our service and then, and then decide to buy a bigger cluster or not. We don't have a lot of users currently who are using it in a day in, day out production, production way. But um, we were interested to see this was higher than we might have expected, 41%. This, this one, um, almost three quarters of the people said they were interested in using GPUs. So a few weeks after this survey, all, all the re results for this survey are, are at this link. But um, we did a, 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 a GPU survey. We got about 50 answers back. Um, that previous survey had 350 roughly answers back. I think um, since it was sent to a similar group that these people, you know, self-selected themselves that they weren't interested in GPUs, they didn't, they didn't answer. Um, I'm not going to go through all, all, the, all, the, uh, all the comments here, but a couple of things um, worth pointing out. I mean, I don't know if you can read them or not, but um, down here, if, if, you, if you take a look at this, there's 40% want to use the GPUs directly from the M language, and which, which would be like MATLAB, and another 22% uh, roughly um, want to just use libraries that are GPU, GPU aware. So, so you know, roughly 60% of the people want to use GPUs because they want to go faster, but they don't want to deal with it at all. They want it to just happen magically. And I think that that is, that is the challenge that we're all uh, in the vendor community anyway, up against at the moment. There's a lot of, there's a lot, a lot of interest in GPUs, but um, no, people don't really want to, to deal with it. And, and, you know, the user community, again, are not the, uh, typically the style of programmers who would be sitting there saying, well, if the job is not bigger than uh, such and such, it's not worth the time to move it out and bring it back and, you know, uh, that kind of thing. So, so it, there's a certain challenge there. Um, there's a, there's a question, let me find it. Um, uh, you know, do you have any expertise in programming GPUs? Uh, no, 52%, 25% no, but, uh, no, but uh, a colleague does, or they think a colleague does. So again, w w we don't think there are, um, there's a, obviously a body of people that, that know how to program GPUs. But people who are remarkably, again, this is self-selecting people who are answering a GPU uh, survey, but, um, you know, almost, whatever, 40, 41 plus uh, 39, well, I could do that if I was not talking at the same time, um, are optimistic that they can get GPU acceleration at, or, or definitely uh, believe that they can get acceleration. So, um, I, don't, I, don't know if, uh, I don't know if this has hit your, your user community, but um, 
I think either we're going to discover that there are a significant number of, of problems that can be sped up considerably with the use of GPUs, or we're going about to run a lot of experiments and have a lot of disappointed people. Um, here was an answer uh, which, you know, makes me humble as somebody that does surveys. I mean, this, this answer basically says, you know, you guys don't know what the hell you're talking about, and, um, and too bad. <laughs> um, it was an anonymous survey, so I can't call up this guy and say, well, what, 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 what did you mean? <laughs> um, so we'll just have to find that out over time. But um, on, on the topic of GPUs, we, we, are, we are doing exactly uh, what I just described, uh, building kernels that um, execute on the GPU and then are controlled at a higher level from, from MATLAB, from M language, um, and, and done in parallel on a cluster. So we, we, had, we had one of these, uh, we had a customer, uh, have a customer who, who, was, who believed strongly that, that their application was, was ripe for, for running at least the compute kernels on the GPU. We ported the, the kernels to the uh, GPU. Uh, the single task performance, in other words, like within a single single node, we got 50 times speed up, and then because we were able to distribute that, that job across a cluster, we, ac we actually got um, 700 times uh, aggregate performance benefit. So that's, that's a big number, right? Um, and, um, you know, GPUs are not that expensive. If you have a, if you have a, a big thing to do, that can be worth it. So it, I think that, well, let me just go back to that. Um, I think the, the tricky thing is that, go, is that going forward, some applications, it's really going to be worth it, and some applications, it's not. Um, um, you know, with the, with the advent of multi-core and accelerators and everything else, um, and different kinds of interconnects and different size nodes, and I think we, we I personally think that we're headed back to a, uh, an era or a time when um, compute flat platforms are going to become more heterogeneous, and uh, you know, if, you, if you pull the clock back to the 80s, let's say, there were a lot of different computer makers making noticeably different kinds of computers, and your code, whether or not it would compile and run on a large set of them, would not compile and run equally well on a large set of them unless you put a lot of effort into it, and uh, we, we, may be, we may be, this is my personal opinion, we may be headed back in that direction. Um, I think I may have uh, said this, but, uh, but, but again, so the way these, uh, our, our product works and many of the other ones do, um, often the client, you, you run some language like MATLAB or pa Python, and uh, secretly you sort of snoop the code, and you take care of doing some things which the, the, uh, the programmer hopefully doesn't have to know too much about, um, like distributing the data sets and distributing the tasks and moving the data as appropriate, and then off on the server, you do all the, the different kind of data parallel, task parallel uh, cal computations. You talk to different libraries, deal with the workload management, security, parallel I.O. You do all the stuff that, that, that your domain expert type kind of programmer doesn't want to do. Uh, the way that looks in, in our product is uh, we have uh, parallel for loops, so which we do with a command we call PP eval. Anyway, um, the, the e an easy example of that is you're, you're going to be doing a lot of, you're going to be analyzing a lot of images of brain slices, so you just start parceling out brain slices to different processors and they run independently. Um, and that's, that's pretty easy for people to understand. Um, so if they have that kind of situation, that's what they do. Uh, another kind of uh, parallelism which actually gave our product its name is um, this uh, star P, um, which is that if you have uh, uh, some kind of data structure, you can put star P on a dimension and that will automatically create it to be distributed across the cluster or across the, the, the memory spaces and then operated on in, in parallel. So this becomes data parallel. Everything happens to all the elements. Um, uh, in fact, the parallelism carries forward. So if you just put, a, in some cases, in the beautiful cases, you just put a star P near the top and then everything that references that N becomes parallel, A becomes parallel, everything becomes parallel, all runs in parallel, and um, th that's that, you know, wh when you hit a customer who has a code that looks like that, it's, you know, it's, it, it is magic. That's not the usual case, I have to admit. <laughs> um, just, to give, just to give a comparison, so this, this, this little routine here, if done in uh, C with MPI, looks like this. 
Um, and obviously, most of what's here is not the logic of the computation. It's all the bookkeeping and the MPI calls and everything. And that, that's, that's the stuff that we hope to prevent people from learning. Uh, a little bit more of benchmarks. Um, a question uh, we often get, and uh, actually got this morning, is, well, okay, so people are not doing work. How much, how much efficiency do they give up? You're, you're obviously not running as fast as, um, there must be some auto advance there. Anyway, you're obviously not running as fast as that hand tube code. So here's uh, HPL, uh, the Olympac benchmark. And um, leaving aside, actually, the, oh no, here we go. Here's percent of peak performance. Here's 50%. Um, on a cluster, if you were to write in, uh, you know, in a lower level language and start, you probably could get maybe 65 to 70 percent efficiency. If you then crank in all the best of the best of the best, you know, you, you get up in the 70s or 80s. So for us, getting, getting you know, around 50 percent on a cluster without, without tuning, essentially, just by writing in a very, very high level language like MATLAB, we think is great. Usually, Usually the, the problem that our customers come to us with is not how do I move from 60 to 73 percent efficiency. Usually the kind of thing they come to us with is, um, you know, I, I need this run to complete overnight or um, I, I want to be able to do this within an hour so that I can go off to lunch and come back and see the answers. There's usually, or, or we have to make some regulatory submission and we have a month to do the following set of runs, and we don't we don't know how to do that. How can we how can we get this computation down within some time? So, so, and I think that makes sense because the 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 people that again are our customers are the domain experts. They're not don't particularly care about the efficiency. They have some some goal in in the processing that they're trying to meet. So, um, we're definitely not as fast as uh, as you would be if you would write it in uh, C++ and MPI and and do everything you can do, but um, again, our goal is to be fast enough and have the programming be the programming be fast enough so that it's easy to do. I mentioned the, the GPU libraries. Um, certainly, certainly, you can write your own kernels. Um, you can tune if if you really want to. We have a couple of customers that have done that. They say, "Oh well, um, glad I got this working." Um, now that I did get it working, I don't really want to rewrite the whole thing if I can avoid it. Um, almost all the computation is in you know this set of stuff. Um, I guess I, I guess I could go write that in C++, and we, we allow people to do that. So if uh, if somebody wants to do that, they can. Um, here's another another benchmark. Um, this is uh, this is running FFT2 uh, and. Um, I don't know that I'm proud of this benchmark because I, th I think what we're doing here is easy, which is to say we're running lots and lots of, of uh, relatively independent things. But um, but we do show that we s we we scale we scale qu quite on up to a large number of, of images uh, in, a, in a small number of time. And even though so you know you get jaded if you've been in, in a certain industry too long, um, but somebody who's never written anything in in parallel whatsoever, um, uh, it's it's quite amazing that they can do um, that many images in, in less in less than a minute, and they could do it without changing their code very much or understanding how torque works or or, or what slurm is or, uh, or that kind of thing. So so this 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 becomes significant for for people who are doing that kind of processing. Oh, that's funny. There we go. So I'm probably ahead of time, maybe. I don't know if there's another. I am. Well, that's good because I have to go to the airport. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so the the the, uh, the, uh, the main point is that you know you can you can solve some big problems by accelerating the desktop tools. Um, and I think you know as the as the hardware gets more heterogeneous, as the data sets get bigger, as as the desktop processors themselves become more multi-core, um, I think we're going to see more and more of a need 
to move people from uh, doing science on their desktop to doing science, even on a small scale, in a cluster where the data sets live uh, and where the big memory machines live and in a way, in a way that's, that's easy. And if, um, if, if it turns out that um, these cloud environments, whether they be public things like Amazon or some government-funded research machines or, or what have you, continues to become more prevalent, then again, we're going to need ways to have people be able to do this easy kind of exploration computing um, in a, on a remote system. So, there you go. So of all the uh, things you put up there on the presentation, the only thing that your customers don't seem to be really into is cloud services. Compared to everything else, they seem to be 80%, 70% interested in cloud. They're only 40% interested in. Do you have any idea why uh, they're not quite into the cloud yet? Well, there's, there's uh, certainly, we have, we, have, um, we have customers in the intelligence community. So uh, now whether or not they could even answer a survey, I, I don't know. <laughs> if, if, if that's there. I know that um, some customers do uh, uh, image processing and work with uh, genetic data sets that are very large and at least it would seem to me difficult to take your machine that's pumping out hundreds of megabytes or you know terabytes a day and compute that over some network link because you'd have to move the data. Um, so I think there are a few categories of users that perhaps fall off immediately. And then I know that in the finance community, there are, um, actually we one of our biggest users was in the finance community, but on the other hand, we had um, a number of financial places just say there's no way we could ever, we could ever consider anything leaving our premises. They're, they're too security minded. So I guess it says, I would guess security and data size. I'm actually curious uh, of an additional slight modification to that question. How, how, how many of you have uh, uh, individual jobs that don't need to go faster, but you'd like to run that many more of them? I did not pay him. I did not pay him. You, sh you showed uh, one slide where a, a customer of yours got 50 times improvement by going to CUDA cores or kernels and then additional 14% by distributing across the cluster. How much of that work was is just the farming it out and how much did you have to customize their code and or in terms of the cost? So th they definitely had to rewrite their compute kernel using CUDA. Using CUDA. Well, we did it together. We did it together. Um, but once that was done, and then there was, it was the standard kind of use of STAR-P that, that does the distribution and the task scheduling. Yeah, but, but in terms of a project, using that as an example, what would the breakdown in terms of cost be? Would it be 50% for your expertise in writing CUDA kernels and 50% for running it or 1090? Well, what's the kind of it, breakdown? It was, I believe, about... 60% in writing the CUDA kernels. And then, you know, some, the percentage of us doing that versus them doing that is kind of just based on the situation. But, it, but it was, that was most of the work. Okay, thank you. There's one in the back. Um, I was just wondering, because we were, we were talking about testing code earlier, um, 
have you guys had much experience working with your clients to actually validate that the code now running on the cluster is actually doing the same thing it did prior to the cluster? Well, there's, there's a first step, which is, um, generally speaking, so in the, in the parallel, the parallel slices example, you know, you, you, know, you know what the answer is for one slice, so it's very easy to, to validate, um, you know, that slice when it was run in parallel, is it the same? There are some other kinds of work that people do, like uh, large-scale knowledge discovery when you're running something like k-means on some huge data set, and you, you, you play with a different number of clusters, and you get some indication of, of something. Um, and uh, quite frankly, I, I, I don't think we've, I don't think there's been an organized attempt to, to figure out, you know, if you, if you had that huge data set, I mean, this is the only way it's been processed. So, um, you know, so I, well, now that I think about it, I hope our customers are applying some, some logic to think, does this answer make sense? But I guess we haven't provided them some other means to, to take some huge run like that and, and somehow verify it. So there's, there's some work for the future. One last question. Well, I had uh, a similar question there when, when thinking about the GPUs. I'm, I'm one of those people that doesn't know how to program on a GPU, but I know a colleague who does. Um, <laughs> and it, one of the things that he was identifying as a potential problem was one of precision in computing on a GPU. And so in a similar vein, have you done any benchmarking of, of results from a GPU computing uh, solution? In terms of double versus single precision, and is it good enough? Precisely. We, we haven't. Um, our, our thought is that, at least our assumption is that, you know, the, the double precision GPUs are on the way. And we're assuming that by the time there's any bulk of people doing this, um, there will be there will be double precision GPUs. There's, a, there's another issue with GPUs, which is um, um, the issue of data integrity. And um, not to slur any GPU, but GPUs are not built to the same um, data integrity standards as CPUs, because usually if one pixel is bad, who cares? Um, and I, again, w we, we talk about that kind of issue with our customer, but we're not, we're not, we're not trying to solve that problem. I know that some GPU vendors are, are planning um, chips that take data integrity more seriously for computation, so hopefully that'll, that'll get better in time also. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.